Lots of familiar faces, some faces I haven't seen in a long time, some lovely surprises, some new folks. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Holly Beatty and I'm the One World Conservation Center Director. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Cat TV for being at all of our presentations. And um, I'd like to ask who has a little purple star on their handout. Okay, you're the lucky winner. Are you a member already? Just 15 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll work on that with Mary. How about that? You don't have, oh, we have one of those. Great. That's no, for you to keep. We've been giving a membership away at each of our uh, series. So uh, the thing to know about the One World Center is that we are a nonprofit and we rely pretty heavily on public donations and community support. And we appreciate you all being here. Um, also, uh, these events are sponsored by the Bank of Bennington. We'd also like to thank them for their generous underwriting of this program. Steve McMahon has been the director of the Hoosick River Watershed Association since 2011. We do have a full bio in your handout, and he's going to have a lot of information for you. So, again, thank you for coming. Let you take it. Thank you, Holly. You're welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, Good evening. So great to have you all come out uh, on the uh, night to hear about the Hoosick River watershed. Um, if you can't hear me, talk to me. I'm used to filling a room with my voice. It's not a problem for me, but so just tell me I can't hear you and I'll speak louder. Hoosick River Watershed Association, you can start clapping now because we're celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. Mm -hmm. 1986, we responded to a, a study that was done on by most of Massachusetts to look at how uh, watershed areas are being treated. And the state plan came up with recommendations for all the watersheds in Massachusetts. And from that, in, uh, the plan was done in the early 80s and from 1986, the Hoosick River Watershed Association was formed. Occasionally, folks, I'm gonna turn my back on you so I can move from slide to slide. All right. Occasionally, folks, I'm going to get the slides to move for you. <laughs> so the Hoosier River Watershed Association is run by a board of directors. We're a membership-supported organization. And I want to make sure I tell you that after the program is over, I want you to come up and brochures on the Hoosick River. There's a list of our events for this, for this uh, spring season through May. And there's, there's always a membership application for anyone who really thinks they want to support a great river. Hoosick <coughs> River supports um, a watershed that's 70 about 70 square miles, and about 70 lengths, 70 miles is the Hoosick River, running from the town of um, just north of Lanesboro in the town of Cheshire, north on the South Branch, and then south from, from uh, Vermont over the line to North Adams, where the two branches merge. Two branches merge and then flow, the uh, Hoosick River flows west. As it flows west, it picks up several major tributaries, and I'll speak to those in a minute, and it flows, interestingly enough, northwest through Parnell, Vermont, uh, and then into New York State, where it flows into the Hudson at Scattercook. At any point during my conversation, please raise your hand and ask me a question, because I'm, I'm going to be very pleased to answer it. This is our mission. We're dedicated to the conservation of the Hoosick River uh, through, water, through advocacy, education, and uh, research. We support research through uh, <laughs> uh, Educational institutions, MCLA, Williams College. We support advocacy by, by prompting state organizations to do their job a little bit better for the benefit of the river. And uh, we, as I say, we've been around for 30 years. This is the Hoosick River. The slide's a little faint for you to see. I'm going to stand over here and point out some key facts. This is the North Branch coming down from um, just Reedsboro, I want to say. Does that sound right? You, you guys are Vermonters. I am not a Vermonter. Yeah. I was born in Massachusetts and lived in Massachusetts all my life. Mm -hmm. South Branch coming up uh, from Cheshire through Adams, North Adams, Williamstown, Pondell, and into New York. Picking up from Cambridge, the Owl Kill, uh, from down here in Petersburg, Cherry Plain picking up the Little Hoosick River, 
from this area, the Bennington River, uh, Bennington area, of course, we pick up the Wolumsic River, uh, coming off the uh, mountains here from the um, Green Mountains down to, um, I want to say, Roaring Branch, Roaring Brook. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Roaring Branch. And then um, the major branches coming in from off the, ticker, the Tom Hannock Reservoir into Scatter Coke and into the Hudson. <coughs> This is what we do. We're mostly a recreation organization. We support projects like an annual member rafting trip on the Hoosick. It goes from North Adams down to Panama, Vermont. We sponsor the Hoosick River Ride. Here we are coming over the bus, bus riders are coming over the Buskirk Bridge. Um, we support the Hoosick River Greenway in, in Hoosick Falls, Mass. And uh, we support trails development both all over the region. If everyone takes their hands, see, this is a little exercise I like to do with children. If you go like this, with your hands, you've got a watershed in your hands. Any water that falls into your hands is going to fall to the bottom of your hands. Into that crease between your two hands is the major river source falls out of your hands. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of activities from the ridge tops down to the bottom where the rivers flow. And that's where we like to be active. More activities. Fishing is very popular. I don't need to tell you that. You see people fishing here on the Willemsick. Um, and down through uh, the Batten Kill, which is just north of our watershed, the Owl Kill, and Little Hoosick River, very, very popular with fishermen. The Hoosick River, I've been told, by people who fish all their lives, has got the most fantastic trout they've ever seen. Um, I always like to tell the story of a gentleman who contacted me, who was a Williams College graduate in 1950, and he said, I fished all over the world, and I caught the three largest trout in my life in the Hoosick River right off the backside of Williams College campus. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a, we've had, in, in, over the years, a river fest event down on Coalfield at Williams College, where we introduce people to the river and all its major components and facets. One of the things that we like to say is we want people to touch the river. To touch the river is to love this river, and because if people sort of know where it is, and we've gone from, I think, a, a society that turned its back on the river and dumped into our, into our watersheds and dumped into our rivers and streams to an, a, a society that turns and embraces its rivers. And we'll talk about that particularly in North Adams where we're trying something very special. One of the interesting things we tried and have tried through the years is called our River Works Art Show. And it varies in times of year. It's always in the spring. This year it's in May, the 20th and 21st of May. We're down on the river. We encourage artists to come and put up displays all through a trail system. And if you enjoy just being outdoors, it's, it's always, our events are always, always free except for one, which is our fundraising Hoos Hoosick River ride. But artists will come and set up all different exhibits on a, on a riverside trail. And there'll be music and food. It's always fun. Anyone recognize the big excavator and where that might be? It's in Vermont. When they took out the dam? Oh, Henry Bridge. They took out the Henry Bridge dam. We, we, we're very much in favor of habitat improvement, and we've been a part of and supported, and this the Henry Bridge dam was not one that, that was our project, but we certainly supported it. But we, we, uh, we have done projects like the Briggs Dam, um, Briggsville Dam over in Clarksburg, and we're working on dams. This is a dam in the town of Adams uh, that we're very much interested in having that taken out because it serves no purpose. It's totally filled up behind it. It's not a water source. It's not a, uh, all it does is. Oh, so, yes, I'm, right. I'm originally from Adams. Where is that? Do you know? Fifth Street. OK. Yeah. Um, Fifth it's, Street. Just, it's just a dam that one time served the mills. Okay. Now, now it doesn't do that anymore. <coughs> Thanks. And we're also very much active in, in taking days out of our year to work on river cleanups. We use the colleges, both MCLA and North Adams and Williams College. Uh, their incoming freshmen love to participate in a river cleanup day. But we have river cleanups day. This uh, photograph in the middle was taken on the Indian Massacre Road. If you ever noticed the debris on the Indian Massacre Road, mm -hmm. volunteers raised their hand and said, not anymore. And they cleaned up a huge amount of trash out of there. Um, and we're going to go back again from time to time and police it again. Somehow the trash, all it takes is one major storm event and new stuff comes downstream. That's McMahon's farm. Mm -hmm. No relation. 
<laughs> no, they always say, yeah, that's why you're cleaning it up. It's McMahon's farm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I want to talk to you about is why we monitor the rivers and how we monitor the rivers. We have a um, wonderful consultant, and I'll show you who, his picture in a few moments, who monitors the rivers from the uh, standpoint of measuring insects. And they're called benthic macroinvertebrates. Why does he measure benthic macroinvertebrates? Well, if you, what's the best, what's the most ideal stream you could possibly have? It's a cold water stream, and a cold water stream supports native trout. Yeah. And a breeding native trout population is the epitome of a great ecology. So you seek, you seek out situations where stream improvement can benefit the native trout population. So the Hoosick River itself is not a cold water stream, but there are cold water streams that feed into the Hoosick. And the Willemsick is probably not a cold water stream, but there are sections of the tributaries that feed into the Willemsick that are cold water streams. And so we measure once a year benthic macroinvertebrates, as well as some other factors that support the substructure or <coughs> the um, ecosystem that allows benthic macroinvertebrates, little, so little fish critters, to survive. Why is that so important? If I have an insect called, and I'll show you a slide in a few seconds, this is actually down in the lower part of the screen, that's a stonefly. If a stonefly exists, that's a great trout habit, trait, trout uh, species that they love to eat. But that's the only species that's there, then once that species hatches and goes through its life cycle, there's nothing for the trout. So you need diversity. Not only do you need diversity, but you need numbers. So um, our consultant, who is Kelly Nolan, will go out every fall and monitor all If you see this too, all these 11 docks is what he does every year. And he's done it since 1986. Or excuse me, not since 1986, from 1990 to <coughs> 2002 for who right? for about 13 years. But he's done it for many years before that for either the state of Vermont or the state of New York or the state of Massachusetts investigating certain problems along the river. And we can begin to think about what those problems might be. And specifically, in North Adams to Williamstown area, the problem is PCBs. From um, Powell North and through Hoosick, it's, um, as we know today in today's news, it's something else, PFOAs. Down further still, there's uh, aquatic invasive plant species that are a problem. All these things contribute to an, issue, uh, a, an ecosystem that can't balance itself and save the fish. And um, I'll, I'll get into more details. The stars you see on that map are indications of places where specific monitoring were done, was done once or twice over um, these many, many years because of a particular problem that was brought up to someone's attention. Again, this is stonefly. This is what we measure. But Stoneflies alone, there's damselflies, there's caddisflies, there has to be a multitude of insect species to make a trout habitat su successful. Wrong direction. This is Kelly Nolan. He's an um, aquatic biologist out of uh, Schenectady, New York. This is business. We couldn't do what we do without him. We're going to go through a series of charts. I got, at the end of this chart system, it's going to look dizzy. <laughs> but the point is, I want you to look at this. The ideal stream is a stream that's above, about this, measuring about here. That's a good, high quality stream. A five is okay. It's a minimally impacted stream. And a, a 2.5 is something's wrong. So you're going to start seeing measurements that took place over the years, beginning in 1983. This is from Jay, uh, Kelly Nolan, who did this graph for us. This is the first study he did in 1983. <laughs> the river's OK. And I should point out that the numbers on the top of, this, of the graph, 1 through 12, 12 is down in Scaticoke. 1 is up in, in uh, Adams, Mass. Yeah. So something is wrong somewhere around Station 9. Station 9 is just below Hoosick Falls. And there was a chemical spill. And the state of New York called out Kelly and said, can you measure this and see what's going on? And he realized that the water quality scale was down. So they cleaned up the spill. The next year they came back and we measured more stations and they noticed things are a little bit better. On station nine, things are not so good on station four. 
and this is what I'm, I'm not going to follow every station, but the high, high water quality, you'll see at the, at the left end of the scale, the right end of the scale, water quality is good. In the middle of the scale, there are headaches. And that's where the, the industry is. Yeah. There's a 1985 study, a big problem, Hosek Falls, <coughs> chemical spill at the uh, Oak Matsui plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're getting a little cleaner right after that spill. They did another measurement. And again, I'm sorry, the graph gets a little dizzy from here on out. Little study done in the, uh, again, the Hoosick Falls, or just below Hoosick Falls area um, in 2001. Low quality around Station 9. I had a list of the stations, but I don't have it in front of me. Water quality back up the following year. Same Station 9, that purple dot shows it pretty high. There's a, there's a whole station, a whole, he did all the stations in this one year, probably as I'm remembering the first year for Hoorah, that he did all 11 stations along the Hoosick, and it's a pretty good year. And again, 2007, getting a little dizzy. As you watch the lines come up, the, the small graphs are a study of a problem, the long graphs are a sort of an analysis of the entire river. This is 2011. Look at that big spike downward around Station 2. Any idea what that might be? 2011. Irene? Irene. What did Irene do? It came with such force it scoured all the mentic macrovertebrates away. There was nothing for the fish to eat. So that's why the reading was so low. Came back the following year, 2012, mm -hmm. things are a little bit better. 2014 is the best year that we've ever had. So the overall results, the river's doing good in terms of benthic macroinvertebrates, insects that fish feed upon. Not the total scene that we're looking at, because another issue that we've benefited from, or the things that we're looking at, is a whole slew of sure. analyses that have to be looked at. Water temperature. If a farmer, and it doesn't happen, but if a farmer in years ago cut right up to the edge of a brook so that he could get all his crop yield, he exposes that brook to, to sunlight. Raises the water temperature, decreases the opportunity for fish to spawn and find a successful habitat. Amount of dissolved oxygen. Fish have to have oxygen. A flowing river um, that's turbid, in other words, a lot of dirt, a lot of debris kicked up the river, it's not a good for oxygen, but if the, rate, if the flow of the river is good over a nice stony surface, it generates a little turbulence, kicks up a lot of oxygen, great for fish. Aquatic invasives. I'll show you a slide in a minute of water chestnut down uh, just above the Johnsonville Dam in New York, where the water quality <coughs> is impaired because of the, the river, stagnant at that point because of the dam, is covered in plant material. Storm water runoff, like I mentioned, at, at Tropical Storm Irene, and finally chemicals. We come to chemicals. This is my slide of, um, actually taken by one of our guests here tonight, of water chestnut covering the Hoosick River. If the, in order for canoeists to get from this boat landing, which is in the foreground, out to the river, which is in the background, you have to, they have to hand pull water chestnuts. And that's done, if you go there in the early springtime, you see nothing, the river is totally clean. You come back in the beginning of July and the river is totally covered. Is it Skadical? Just above Johnsonville Dam. Mm. In, um, Buskirk. Above the Johnson, by the backwaters? The, the back Just above the fire station in, Bus in Johnsonville. Hmm. Oh, I know. All right. All right. <clears throat> PCBs are a part of uh, industry. I've never seen it down there. You used to trap that. It's PCBs are part of our industry in the making of capacitors and uh, generated uh, substation. Um, transformers. And there, as it says here on the slide, um, polychlorinated biphenyl. It does not degrade. It's an oily substance that attaches to uh, most uh, the silt that's in the river, not necessarily um, the animals themselves, but the animals that eat, the tiny critters that eat 
um, plant material ingests the, the, the PCBs, they stay in their system, it's, it doesn't degrade, the, the tiny critters themselves are eaten by larger fish and uh, so on, all the way up to the point where large predators like eagles or herons are ingesting fish and getting very serious about the PCBs, at least they were. Mink too. They're very good. Mink too. too. Yeah, you're absolutely right. These are levels of crayfish. Williams College, uh, Dave Richardson is here tonight, professor at Williams College, had students measure crayfish populations in the Hoosick. They were easily, easily captured by students. They were crushed up, sped through um, separators and, and they have devices I can't even begin to remember, <laughs> such that you got to some heavy duty analysis so they could tell where PCBs were and where the quantities were. This is Lime Streets and Adams. Boundary Road's just on the uh, south end of North Adams. Um, I forget what ACC says, but it's probably at the junction of the two rivers. The Vermont Dam, upstream of Vermont Dam, downstream is the dam at the tannery in Powell. What's safe? Safe for PCB levels is roughly 0.25 and, <coughs> and below. So we had some problems in the Hoosick in regards to crayfish populations having higher levels of PCB. Make sense so far? Here's a spike. Here's a problem. Everything for PCBs below two or two and a half is fine, right? But there's a spike here and it's a ground what the Williams College students call ground zero. Ground zero was in Brown Street, if I'm remembering right, in North Adams, where they actually manufactured the PCBs and dumped them into a landfill which seeped into the Hoosick River. <coughs> Monitoring this stuff, is, these PCBs in the environment, not easily done. Um, in fact, it takes a chemistry lab like Williams College or a major institution or a major private lab in order to do analysis like this. There is good news. As you can see in this slide, PCB levels are much lower than um, they were at the beginning. And the two samples that they did discover in Vermont, um, they're below what the Vermont DEC considers to be safe. These are students doing analysis from Williams College. Um, and they've just begun an analysis over the last year on trout species. They had volunteers fish the hoosick. Geez, that was hard to get people to do. <laughs> but the tough part was they had to give up their fish. <laughs> Um, which is good news because you're not supposed to eat the fish as a, as a uh, health hazard against eating the fish caught in the Hoosick River because of high levels of PCBs. So the, they, they gave up fish and the students have been doing analysis and uh, Dave has told me tonight that they've just finished the analysis on fish samples taken in the last um, fall. The students gave an analysis of their findings, actually it was in January, they gave an analysis of their findings which said that of the three fish that were totally analyzed, PC level, PCB levels weren't that bad, uh, but they, I'm dying to see the results from a larger fish sample study. Um, how many more fish were there, Dave? Yeah, two dozen. Two dozen fish were. What size were the fish that weren't analyzed? Some were really, really big. Of the three that were caught, one was like a 30-inch yeah, trout. Huge. And a monster. <laughs> um, and the others were the standard size. One was a 12-inch, maybe one was a little smaller. Thank you. Now, what's, what are we working on as an organization? We're trying to have a vision for doing better things in the Hoosick River. And some things I want to talk to you about are this Thompson Mill site. Ever been to um, Valley Falls, New York? Across, across the river, there's an old mill that was burned down, I, th I think, in the 90s. Um, we're working with the Rensselaer Land Trust in the state of New York to have this declared a brownfield site so that we can have an analysis done and take this whole monster down and make this into a riverside park. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great vision, one that we're really excited about. The Hoosick River Revival, once a part of our organization now independent and on their own and doing great things in the city of North Adams, as you know, in Adams, in North Adams, um, the, the river was encased in concrete chutes in the 1950s um, as, a, as a result of severe storm damage that occurred 
prior to that. The Army Corps of Engineers poured concrete barriers to channel the river through the city. And essentially, as I decided before, talking about how people turned their backs on it forced people to look away from the river. The river was a bad thing. But there has been visionaries in North Adams, Judy Grinnell being one of the primary, uh, the primary spokesperson, has got this vision for recreating an atmosphere where the, ri where the river slopes down, or the banks of the river slope down. Mm. And it allows for flood storage, allows for the capacity for a river to come up and go down. People can get down to the river and have access to it, walk along its banks, incorporate things like the Asherwood Creek Trail, which runs from Lanesboro to Adams right now, and will one day run all the way just below Pound of Vermont and Williamstown. The Tannery Dam and Pound, we're working with Bill Scully. Many of you probably have heard or know of Bill Scully. Um, he's done a great thing here in, in uh, North Bennington, creating hydroelectric power from the dam site. It was there anyways. He did, took something that was existing and made it better. He wants to do the same thing at the Tannery Dam in, in North Pound. We want him to help us get a canoe access or a portage site from above the dam to below the dam. We, we built one below the dam in the, 19, in the late 1980s. But we need a way to get around that railroad track and back down to the river. And we hope Bill's going to partner with us on that. I'm sorry. Since I worked in Mass Mocha for 17 years, that's the encasement. That, that, that waterway that runs right next to Mass Mocha is the encasement? Yeah. I looked at it for out of my office for 15 or 17 years. I was wondering what it was. <laughs> In the tropical storm Irene, in 2011, the flood normally, when we, when we talk about having an event on the Hoosick River, we talk about it needing a flow rate of about, at a minimum, 200 feet per second, 200 cubic feet per second in order to put a raft on the river. Sure. High water flow is seven to 750 cubic feet. Then we sort of say we really can't go on there because it's flowing too fast, we can't stop. The flow rate of Tropical Storm Irene, measured by the gauge at the um, USGS station in, in, Ad in North Adams, 13,500 cubic feet per second. <laughs> yeah. That's a flow rate. I mean, that's going to scour. That's going to do a lot of damage. You had to compensate for that flow. It did not reach the top of the chutes in North Adams. People in the city said, this is what these things were built for contain this river because it did a lot of damage in Williamstown. Spruce's uh, residential park was almost wiped out entirely. But the um, benefit of having those chutes is to contain the water. The disadvantage is no one sees the river anymore. So that's my brief talk. Um, I hope you like what I said. I'm open to questions. I hope we have a great discussion on the river. Thank great. you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Did you say the Batten Kill is not part of the Batten Kill has its own watershed association. It's, it's, um, it flows into the Hudson uh, north. Of, it's, a, it's a divide. I forget what, what the mountains would be. It mm -hmm. keeps the Batten Kill from entering into the Hoosick River. Thank you. Yes, sir. Years ago, I uh, paddled uh, in a race from Pownal to Hoosick Falls in canoes and we did a section, well we did the whole river, but we did a section behind Wysocki's farm in Fusa Falls. Do you know the area? I now? think so. Had they cleaned that up down in there? They found some work in there. Yeah, um, because they, it was right loaded with cars and trucks. And, I, and the last time we had, we actually we had a group of uh, student interns, once every five years we try to do a canoe, or what we call a source to sound, uh, in this case source to Hudson. Canoes they've all been them. removed. And, but they've all, they, they didn't see anything like that. Yeah. I remember the, having firemen down there just to watch and make sure nobody got tangled up in there. I know that uh, we have slides dating prior to my time of a milk truck being pulled out of the Hoosick in Williamstown. I mean, <laughs> one of those old milk trucks. Still intact, I mean, intact as you could identify it as a milk truck. Yes? Oh, good. A good question. Um, doesn't the Batten Kill flow into the Owl Kill? You've got me. He <laughs> wins. He wins a free membership from the one where comes up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know where the Batten Kill empties into. I know the Owl Kill flows into the Hoosick. So I, if it does, then I'm not sure that the Batten Kill would be 
Um, anybody know? The hell is the I believe the bad killer into the Hudson. Bad killer into the Hudson, so yeah. this gentleman said. Oh, they're back in my house. They all killed. What do you think? Right? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you explain, like, in <coughs> Hoosick Falls, of course, there's a water crisis, um, and apparently things like that are happening all over the country, like Flint, Michigan. Um, but in that case, there the water contaminated is groundwater, or is it also associated with the, the Hoosick River? Is the groundwater came that there? Do they have wells? How, where did they get their water, Hoosick Falls? The situation in Hoosick Falls is such that, as I understand it, I'm not an expert. I've only gathered my knowledge from what I've read. Yeah, maybe other people have. Yeah. And I'm welcome to other comments. Is that the, the water from the contamination of PFOAs flowed into the soil from the Seiko Bain site? Not necessarily Seiko Bain as an industry, but either prior industry or some technology in the Seiko Bain process that led to this chemical being dumped. It flowed into the ground just south of the Seiko Bain site is where the town of village who's called drilled pump stations for their wells. They had an old water treatment center just below that was an old brick building that was just been out of use for many years. But they pumped these wells and that those wells picked up the PFOAs and uh -huh. as I understand it. Is it in the river? As, as from my knowledge is this chemical flows into drains and it's been dumping through the septic system and into the sewer treatment sewer treatment plants in our country were designed to do one thing, treat organic waste. Never meant to treat the chemicals that are flowing through there today. From, as I've been reading in different articles, sent to be microbeads that are in our yeah, plastics, yeah. plastic pro you know, plastic products um, flow into this, and fish eat these things and they don't know, not, not part of the natural fish environment. Um, an article sent to me today was one on lake trout in the Great Lakes being exposed to a different, entirely different chemical, PFTE, if I'm not mistaken. And what that chemical is doing to lake trout is, is unsure, but what that effect will have on human beings is completely unknown. But they know that the fish are being affected by this new chemical. So to answer your question, these chemicals are in our environment every day. And sometimes we know right away, sometimes, you know, and the effects of, just think of looking back at DDT, how long it took for DDT to wake up this country. Uh, it took quite a bit. Things, a lot of things had to die before we sort of change the way we do things. Yes, sir. Is there any evidence of the PFOAs being airborne, like through smokestacks? Uh, I understood that that can happen. Um, I don't know. I guess from what I've been told, PFOAs exist everywhere. If you were to go measure your drinking water at your house, you would mm -hmm. have PFOAs in it, probably well below. They measure PFOAs in... Uh, in parts per billion, mm. not parts per million. Mm, it's a very small quantity. It's a very, very small quantity. But it exists because it's almost so ubiquitous in our mm. industry and our society. Remember, PFOAs are, are the backbone of Teflon. Teflon is what we use in our country for most, most everything that we need to slip and slide. Well, yes, sir. Could you mention about the removing dams? Uh, could, would, any industry that was along the watershed, could they say, we'd like to try once again hydroelectric that took place years ago, or many, many years ago. Could any of them do that? Would They They have to go through the, a strict, strict permitting process. Okay. Um, I think Bill Scully was successful because he showed that that <coughs> flowed through a certain channeling system that allowed his turbines to work. There's a similar, there's a gentleman down in the town of Cheshire, uh, Adams Cheshire Line that has a is an existing dam that would divert water around a very simple generating low capacity uh, megawatts generating and he's petitioned the state but it takes so so many years to go through a permitting process it's difficult but the Pownal Dam our North Pownal Dam the ta what they call the old tannery dam had the capacity to do just that they channeled the water to run these turbines that run in the mills uh, why couldn't they do the same thing for electric power somebody came to um, the state of Vermont or the state of Massachusetts or the state of New York said, we want a new dam. Then we'd raise our hand and say, no, that's wrong. You know, wait a second, we need to talk about this a little further. Not that we won't talk to anyone who wants to put in hydro dams about the benefits, cost benefits of supporting a natural and aquatic ha habitat and ecosystem. <coughs> but 
Um, the Dammer River, the Stopper River, brand new, is a different story entirely. And I suppose then the same would be if anybody wanted to get so ancient with a water wheel type effect, the water, the river probably moves too fast or something like that. What? Both actually, the river moves too slow in some areas, and the river moves too fast. Um, if, if it moves too slow, what, what an engineer would do is raise the height of the dam to increase the head pressure. If the river moves uh, too fast, you lower the dam or you, you stretch out the flow of the water and it decreases its, its speed, you get it, and you change the dynamics of the turbines. And I'm way over my head as I begin to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> they have they done any studies at all on a volum sack? Hoorah! We hope you're doing more. We hope you're doing more soon. The, common, uh, the state of Vermont has, has done, as many states do, do regular measurements of their of their rivers and streams. Massachusetts, I know, does it every five years. Then the studies they do sit on the shelf for another five years, and they finally get around to analyzing them. And they, they're always in the state of catch up. All the states are like this, budgets are tight. Vermont does good studies and produces good data that um, anyone can have access to on the quality of the service, but they can't get to every stream and every issue. So if we can help the, uh, the state of Vermont, we're going to do that. Any other thoughts, questions? I'd like you? to thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> and I thank all of you here for coming to join us for this wonderful talk. Um, next week, we move off waters, water, um, I think for the first time in this series. And we will have a lecture on our post-agricultural forests. And that will be the end of the 1916 valley we live in, and we'll welcome ideas for 1917. 2000. Mm -hmm. yeah. Across the 200th century, man. I did? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> How do you know? We all know where we are, I think. <laughs> Again, I want to point out that there's sure. free flyers on our events. Membership applications. Uh, and thank you again. You've been a great, great people to talk with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.